Welcome everyone to our conversation with a pro in the writing community. This is an event hosted by Writers on Fire, which is a Nexus Generation community. My name is Nikki Tate and today we are chatting with a literary agent, um, Amy Tompkins from Toronto. Amy has worked in publishing since 2002 and has been with the Transatlantic Agency since 2007. She represents children's authors, adult authors, select illustrators, and uh, handles some international rights as well. Amy's a graduate of the publishing program at Ryerson University and has a Master of Arts in uh, English, Language, and Literature. She's the secretary of PACLA, which is the Professional Association of Canadian Literary Agents, and she teaches in the Creative Book Publishing Program at Humber College in Toronto. So welcome, Amy, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and have a chat. Uh, You're welcome. About, yeah. Um, so why don't we start right at the very beginning and give us a super quick overview of what it is exactly that a literary agent does. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we're a type of publishing professional uh, that works for off works on behalf of our clients to sell things. So, so one part of my job, a big part of my job is sales. So I am um, representing authors and selling their manuscripts to uh, publishers, book publishers. And um, then I also sort of I, I help with manuscript development. Um, agents follow the book through the whole publishing process. So um, I, I help like start out with like a, a draft manuscript. I help work on the manuscript, though I'm not an editor. Um, what you get from me and many agents like me are more like readers notes. And then I will send the, um, the project out to publishers who might be interested in it. And um, when there's a, a sale, I negotiate the the um the contract and um we review royalty statements usually the money flows through like the author's money flows through the agency um, when you have an agent and so we um, at my agency any incoming money we work on commission so in money advances or royalties come in for an author we do that commission and then the rest goes on to the author um, we help authors have difficult conversations with their publishers. Um, we, um, uh, what else do we do? We, we handle tricky issues. We handle problems. If something goes south for a book, then the agent is the one, the agents are involved in that. Um, uh, for new authors, I'll often do a lot of, um, give them a lot of advice on the publishing process, things that they, they might not know and might be embarrassed to ask their publisher. They can ask me because there's, you know, there, there's no, they, they don't, you know, they can be very open with me about what they don't know and what they're, what they're confused by and I can explain the process. Um, uh, we offer career advice. We uh, market uh, foreign rights. So it's possible for books, uh, for many books, um, novels particularly, uh, to only sell English language rights to one publisher and then sell translation rights separately uh, through a network of agents that we have that we work with throughout the world. And um, film and television sales. We also represent books for films, TV. Okay, so that's quite the long list of of pieces that you actually yeah. find yourself involved with why so the many many ways that one can be involved in the publishing industry why is it that you chose this particular spot to settle into uh, well um it, so um part of it was because this is where i found a job like I, I found a job in an agency i was uh uh when i started um after i finished my master's degree i moved to toronto which is really expensive it's expensive to live here and um, so I had a, a, a job and that was not related to anything I'd studied, anything I was really interested in with the Ontario government. And um, uh, yeah, I started taking courses in the book publishing program at Ryerson, which is a continuing education program. So you can do it at that time. There's different ways of doing it now, I think. But at that time, they were like night, night courses. So I would work during the day and then a couple days a week, I would go down to the Ryerson campus and take courses and I take, took them two at a time. Um, and I was, I wanted to get into the industry, but I couldn't afford um, an unpaid internship because you really, you know, unpaid internships are like, 
well, even the paid internships, they might be a thousand dollars for three months, which you can't possibly live off of. So um, I started applying for entry level positions in publishing and uh, applied at uh, not the transatlantic agency, but a different agency where I got hired to work at the front desk, worked my way up and um, yeah, I like it. It's, it's a very, it's a, like a blend of like business and creative. Mm. Okay. And uh, you clearly must have a sense of inner calm and good negotiation skills because I heard in your initial list, I deal with problems. <laughs> <laughs> I help smooth over trouble spots. Is that, would that be a fair assessment? Um, yeah, but, but I think I've become, I mean, yeah, uh, like it, it still gives me, um, you know, my, my stomach still clenches when I have to have those difficult conversations. But uh, with experience, you, you get calmer. Like it's, it's the, the longer you've been working as an agent and working in agencies, the more problems and issues you've seen, you've dealt with yourself or seen dealt with. So I generally now, like, it's very rare now for me to be like at a complete loss mm. uh, relation relating to a problem. Like I usually know the path forward and I might still talk to my colleagues about it and bounce ideas off of them. But usually I, I know how to proceed just based on experience. Right, right. And that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you this. Uh, there are many types of uh, projects, book projects that might uh, come across your desk. Uh, what, what kinds of projects or books or authors do you like to represent? What are your favorites? Uh, my favorites are really good writers. <laughs> like really excellent writing craft like like honestly that's the number one thing I look for unless someone is really uh has a high profile like a high profile nonfiction person uh someone who has an, a nonfiction book idea where there may be an expert in the area I don't you know the craft is sort of secondary but for um you know I like to work with writers who are um serious about their 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 work and their craft um, in, and, um, I like authors who work in different genres. That's, that's, that's cool. And it, it keeps things lively for me. And, and because I represent a lot of children's authors, that's often the case. Like everyone at some, every children's author at some point, even if you take them on for novels, um, they'll come up with a picture book <laughs> at some point, you know, so you do end up with this variety. Um, I particularly love children's nonfiction. That's, that is something that I really, really love. And um, I, I find delightful. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. On the adult side, um, I like, again, like really good writing. Um, I'm more eclectic on the adult side, partially because I don't have as many clients. I don't have like the a bulk of clients on in, working um, in adult books. Um, so uh, I, I, my taste leans literary, but I also like commercial things. Okay. And I've actually um, ended up representing quite a bit of memoir on the adult side. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. If uh, just as a side note, um, in the agency, there, how many agents are at uh, Transatlantic now? About 18. 18. Holy smokes. 18. That's, that's growing. Yes. Um, so yeah. if something came across your desk, it's a strong piece of writing, but not quite your niche potentially within the office. Is there passing of manuscripts back oh, yeah. and forth and, hey, have a look mm -hmm. at this? And, yeah. yeah, every day. Yes. Yeah, that happens every day. Right. We know each other's taste. I mean, some of the new people, I don't actually know their taste yet. Like there's somebody who joined us last month. I mm -hmm. don't quite know her taste yet. I think I know what kind of illustrations she likes. She took on an illustrator. Okay. But um, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, there's lots of passing around. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about um, this question? I mean, we're, we're talking with you as an agent. Please don't take this the wrong way. But does every author actually need an agent? Uh, no. I mean, you, you actually, every author can't have an agent because there aren't enough agents, like, <laughs> to represent them. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, this, is, this is a personal thing. Um, yeah, it's very personal. Um, if you're working with a lot of independent publishers who will accept unsolicited submissions and you can get relationships going with them, um, then you might choose not to have an agent. Um, if you want to work with the with the big five publishers, that's um, Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Hachette, Simon & Schuster, and Macmillan, if you want to be submitting your books to those publishers, you need an agent. So it depends on what your goals are. Like if you are a highly literary writer and your books are only likely to be published by um, uh, 
biblioasis, <laughs> but, you know, to, to name like a really, you know, like a gold chip independent publisher in Canada, then you don't need, you don't necessarily need an agent. There are things you can't do. Um, a lot of people get to a point in their career, even if they're kind of on in the, you know, I don't need an agent camp. Um, there's a point that people get to in their career when they realize that they can't go to the next level. Like it's hard to go to like another level. Like if you are like, like a, um, if you want to have your books published internationally, um, your publisher can do that for you, but you can, um, in many cases, some of them don't have the connections or the resources to, to really be selling foreign rights. Um, uh, yeah, you can't, you make more money if you have an agent and your books are being sold internationally. And it's hard to know what to do, for example, with film and TV rights. Um, if you get an offer from uh, a production company, somebody picks up your book and a producer calls you and, and say, says, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to option your book. Well, how do you suss that out? That, that's, that's something that's it's, it's difficult to do. It's, it's difficult for an independently published author or uh, an unagented author to do those things on their own. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about those subsidiary rights then and that process. So I think uh, there is a perception that a literary agent just stops at the, at the, the book. What, how does that work if someone um, has subsidiary rights that are handled by you? A, do they have to sign over their film and TV rights to you? But if they do, mm -hmm. how does that process work? How do you um, market those secondary yeah. subsidiary rights? Um, uh, well, uh, generally speaking, if I want, if somebody wants to work with me, I would probably not be very eager to work with them if they wanted to not have film and television handled by me, unless they already had a film TV agent, a separate film TV agent. I have some clients who have, uh, who are screenwriters who already have, um, a film agent who knows how to handle book, uh, book to TV that's fine. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Um, it would be actually it would be a red flag for me if somebody wanted to like really carve off what I was, what I was going to be representing for them and wanting to make it very small and specific, I would be like, well, you know, I don't, you know, that, that wouldn't be appealing for me. Now, I think I've gotten off track on the, on your question though. Um, film and TV. So um, subsidiary rights, the way they work is um, when a, if, if, if the rights aren't all granted to an English language publisher, then when the manuscript is ready to show, so usually when it's been edited once, or if it's really, really clean and it's going to be very, very commercially interesting to um, publishers in Europe, for example, um, uh, I will send it out to, um, there's, there are people called book scouts. And um, scouts work for, for publishers in Germany and the UK and France and Spain, all around the world, reading material, looking for material for their publisher clients. And scouts work very closely with agents and also with um, rights, publishers' rights departments. Um, so I will feed them information so that they can, um, they, do book, they do reports before book fairs. And throughout the year also, um, finding material for their publisher clients. So at the same time as I send things out to the scouts, I also send them out to my co-agents in, in other markets. So, so um, at the agency I work at, we have a network of, I don't know, like maybe 20 different agents that we work with in different territories. And um, they, um, if some, I'll send them material if they think that they can sell it in say Korea then they will um, submit it to Korean publishers and try to find a publisher for it. And so they're like my partner in that territory. And um, so authors make more money if they have an agent handling their sub rights, because if you don't have an agent um, handling the sub rights and the publisher is handling the subsidiary rights, all the money that from those foreign rights sales goes towards earning down your advance. To your that you're that you've received from your publisher and you're also splitting it with the publisher so in some cases you can do that some cases you can't if the book is illustrated it's unless you are an author illustrator it's you pretty much have to like be granting world rights to your publisher um 
but if it's um, because the public because there's another there's another creator in the mix mm -hmm. the illustrator is the other creator and um, or if a book is heavily designed the, the publisher will own that book design um does that yeah. answer your question it, that does actually that gives <laughs> yes and then some uh -huh. um so <laughs> Well, it's complicated, the subsidiary yeah. rights. And I think it there's is. sometimes some concern that, um, that that an author might be better off to withhold certain rights and try to deal with them themselves, um, or that they are somehow losing control of their um, intellectual property. What uh, are your thoughts on, on concerns like that? In well, well, I mean, we, we're like intellectual property is like my my client's intellectual property is my number one concern like like that is my number one concern like honestly like uh protecting and helping them exercise it so so there's two parts to copyright one is being identified as the author of the of of the copyrighted work and the other is benefiting financially if you want to do so from that copyrighted work so those are like, like copyright is my business. Intellectual property is my business. And um, so when you're working with an agent, just some, one of the um, misconceptions is that you are granting your rights to your agent or your agent is controlling them. Your agent is only doing that on your behalf. You are empowering them to act on your behalf. You are not empowering them to do, to accept any, something on your behalf. You're not empowering them to like, um, do anything else like it's it's still your intellectual property and um, we are ethically as agents like part of the the ethics of agenting is that you never accept an offer without you, you don't accept the offer your your client accepts the author offer the agency doesn't or the agent doesn't sign the contract the author signs a contract and um, um, yeah so so you're not losing control of it it's actually if you are if you are granting rights to a publisher there are limits you know you whatever is in that contract the the, the parameters of your relationship with the publisher are set in that contract so um there there uh, when you are public when you are signing a publishing contract yes you are you are losing some control um but um um you know an agent can help you understand what your what you're losing control of, what the limits to that to that are. Um, I work to negotiate contracts that give my clients as much control over over things as as you want. I mean, if you want 100% control over your cover, the, the cover of your book, you're not going to get it from a publisher unless you are the illustrator of that book as well. So, so mm -hmm. an author illustrators dealing with certain companies and I know which companies those are um, will the companies depending on sort of the way that the company operates they might give you more control of the cover design if you are say, say it's a graphic novel um, and you're de designing the cover um, yes but like I never I, I never control rights the rights my client controls the rights and I help them exercise those rights Got you. And then after the fact, protecting them and making sure that the uh, on the publishing side that all was being honored and handled appropriately, right? Yes. Yeah. And yes. if not, the difficult conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and hopefully we've built in, depending on the circumstances, we've built in controls into the contract. We've right. built in penalties if things aren't done the way it should be done. If right. your book doesn't, you know, if they don't pay you, there's penalty for the, for the publisher. Usually author can get the rights back, things like that. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking, um, you're in Canada, I'm in Canada, but of course you also represent clients in the United States as well and deal with American mm -hmm. cultures mm -hmm. and internationally beyond the U.S. shores. So what are some of the, um, the big differences between working with Canadian and U.S. publishing houses? Uh, there's not much difference, actually. Um, the Canadians, uh, some of them, there was, there was a very anti-agent sentiment among independent Canadian publishers that still lingers. <laughs> but um, so, you know, that, that, that can be a challenge where they, 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 they kind of get their hackles up. Some of the independent companies who don't deal with agents often. That happens in every territory, though. I mean, there's territories that are more, that have more of an issue with agents than, than, than Canada, like France. <laughs> The mm. publishers in France are not big fans of agents. Um, uh, um, 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, what about, what about in terms of the ease of approach for an author in the States versus Canada, if there was an anti-agent bias in Canada to a certain extent, um, does that make it easier for, for people early in their careers to just reach out? Or is that also the same in the United States for smaller independent houses? Well, you know, um, it's probably easier in Canada, I'd say. I, 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 that, that's, that's, my, that's my feeling about it. There are some American independents that are open to submissions, unagented submissions. I mean, if you look at the, um, if you look at publishers' websites, you find out if they're open to unagented submissions or not. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, even the pup, the even like the the um, the companies that are open to unagented submissions, they still read the agented submissions first. Oh, that's interesting. That's good they, to know. They do. Good they do. Up. They read. Okay. They if they see my name in their inbox, they they read it first. Like okay. it's just the way it goes. If they if they see an agent that they know, then they will read that first. For an agented submission, those those get priority. Um, unagented submissions often go into essentially like a like a like a general mailbox and they have a junior staff member reading those things and where i am submitting to like more editor like acquiring editors of whatever level often senior editors right okay so that totally makes sense so clearly mm-hmm. there are advantages to having an agent and yeah. i think all authors have heard that that process can be quite difficult to find an agent to represent their work yes so for sure, what is the best way for a first time author to find an agent? Um, the best way would be to find a, to, to make friends with a published author and get a recommendation to their agent. <laughs> uh-huh. oh, OK, that would be the best way. Um, you can also uh, connect with agents at writing conferences where they're doing like they often have agents. They're doing taking pitches. That can be a good way to be connected even kind of tangentially to, to agents. So um, uh, there's a, a, one of the agency authors was somewhere and she connected with um, an, a new author, first time author, and they, they got friendly. And this first time author sent the, the, the published author her manuscript and she read it and she's like, oh, this is hilarious. I have to get it to agent X. And then she passed it on to Agent X and said, look, would, would you or one of the other agents there be interested in this? And then that, that author got an, an, an agent. But I mean, that, the, the thing there was that it was quite special. Like, I mean, there's, there's lots of things. First of all, I think you need to make sure that what, you're, what you've got, what you're trying to, to sell, what you're trying to find a publisher for is, is actually really, really good. Because like, that's the main thing. Your work has to be really, really good, and it also has to um, uh, it also has to be marketable for for the for the current times, which is hard for you to find out. I mean, the um, although you can find out at you know things like Canscape meetings or SCBWI meetings or talking you know just looking at what else is in the bookstore and and how how close or far away your um, your work is from um, what's being published. But the main thing is making sure it's like as absolutely good as it can be. Okay. Um, but also querying. Sorry, that's another thing. I shouldn't like I should not neglect the whole querying thing because um, querying agents. So you so you research agents, go to the agency websites, look at what their their um, specific requests are for how they want to receive submissions. Make sure they're actually open to submissions because there's nothing. Um, there are agents who will like block you if you are close to submissions and you query them anyway. There are agents who, who will just like, it's like, no, you know, this is, this is a very simple barrier that I've set up because I need to pay attention to, um, things for my current clients at this moment, please do not query me now. And there were people who will query you anyway. Mm. I find that, I think it's forgivable. It's okay. People are enthusiastic. People are hustling. There are other agents I know who, for them, it is not forgivable to 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 try to to push past that and not respect that boundary. So um, make sure that um, you're following the submission guidelines for whomever you're querying. Okay, and I suppose yeah. that that also um, 
will determine, for example, what it is that you should include in that initial approach. So whether you have first three chapters and an outline or entire manuscript or whatever that would look like, right? That information mm -hmm. is available on, on the website? Yes, and, and um, for uh, agents who use um, Query Manager, authors can go in through Query Tracker. I think the, the, the author end of it is called Query Tracker. And then the agent end of it is called Query Manager. So um, sometimes the, the, um, the parameters are set up on Query Manager. Um, and, or if you are on, um, like the websites will tell you what they want to see. A, a, standard, a standard thing that you would need to prepare if you're preparing to query, um, either agents or publishers, um, you wanna have a query letter that has with like a really clear, concise pitch um, that communicates um, what you've got and, and how it fits into um, how, how you would position it next to other books of its kind. So you could include a thing called an elevator pitch, which could be like, um, what's one that I, uh, Dairy Girls meets Billy Elliot. That's the pitch for Barry Squires back here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it could be um, Jurassic Park meets me, we, we Bought a Zoo. Uh, it, you can use films, film comps, or like that's an, that's sort of an elevator pitch where you 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 could you you kind of one one technique is to mash up two things, you know, to bring two things together. Film and television is fine. Books are fine um, to to compare the two things. An elevator pitch is basically like as concisely as possible. Tell me what your project is. Right. Um, so query with um, information about the book, information about the author. Um, including where you live, because that's, that's interesting to me. So um, uh, if you are in the UK and querying me and you don't have a connection to Canada, what I will suspect is that every agent in the UK has already passed on representing you. So, you know, there is a, there is a bit of an advantage to querying within your home country, querying agents within the country that you, you live in. Um, within North America, there's, there's a lot, I mean, half the agents in my agency are American. So, um, you know, we get, we, we have um, clients from both countries. Um, yes. So put where you are, where you come from, um, a little bit about you, if you are currently published, if you have a connection or a referral to that, to that agent, include that. Um, and then I always ask for uh, like a 20 page writing sample, unless it's a pitch book and then I can see the whole, see the whole thing. Um, but yeah, uh, sometimes they, people only want, like one of my colleagues was doing um, uh, the Divi Diverse Voices Twitter pitch uh, today. And I noticed that she was asking for um, a little, uh, a query plus three pages. Oh, super quick. Cool. project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's another way to find agent, a very agents, a very new, new modern way is to do, um, take part in Twitter pitches. Huh. I had not even heard of that. So a uh, yes. hashtag Twitter pitch, is that how you would track uh, those down? Or? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can research them on the, research them online because so like this week they had, they had DV pit, which diverse voices pitch. Okay. events so they like their pitch events and you have a creators can put up they can use the hashtag and then editors and agents interested in their um in what in in the in the pitch like that like you really need a good elevator pitch to make it work on dv pit or any of these pit or pitch wars okay and right. they get like liked or retweeted by editors and agents and then that's an invitation to send them your project oh cool mm -hmm. okay. excellent Huh. Well, that's a little more um, instant gratification than uh, back in the day when you put it all in an envelope and <laughs> sit yes. back for right, six months. Yes. Yes. Well, I I've only ever rarely participated in those pitches, because those pitch wars, because I'm too busy. Like it's mm -hmm. just it's too. And I find that some of my best my best um, uh, that my best connections come from referrals from existing clients. OK. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, speaking of clients, who, uh, well, actually, no, let's double back. So you mentioned you're busy. Um, how many submissions do you typically receive in a, in a month or however you track that? And of those, how many are you actually able to represent? 
Um, well, I don't totally. So I haven't been open to queries ever for a full year. Like I, I don't usually stay open to queries for that long. So I couldn't tell you in a year when I am open to queries, when I'm accepting queries, I probably get five a day more at certain times of the year. Like there seems to be more querying going on in like January and September when people have like a kind of back to school feeling, new year feeling. Right. Um, there were more more pitches during there were more queries during COVID when people were like maybe off work and working on their writing projects that they've neglected or hadn't gotten around to and they were, you know, taking that opportunity to 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 polish things up. Right. Um but I don't take on very many new clients in a year. I'm I would actually probably probably depends on where you are in your career, right? Like I have a, 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 a colleague who started, who, you know, who joined the agency like last month and she's got five clients. So she signed, signed five in a month. That's like a lot. She, she had plans to sign some of them before, <laughs> before she joined the agency though. Like she had those kind, she had some of these, these people in mind. Um, I maybe do five a year, maybe. I'll take five, five new clients. Sometimes um, because we are so, um, uh, because we're so big and we, we have like, so I'm an, I'm more of an expert in children's books. Then I have a lot more knowledge of children's books than some of the other agents on the Canadian side of Transatlantic. So um, one of my colleagues, my colleagues will sometimes say, well, um, would you like to work on this with me? Um, and then I will work on, so if somebody has a, so they're like, oh, surprise, I have a picture book. And, and their agent's like, I thought you wrote adult nonfiction. I have no idea about picture books. They will maybe uh, we'll work together, co-agent something. So I do have like a couple of things that I've taken on where we've, where we're, you know, I've taken on individual projects in collaboration with another agent, um, which sometimes can be a full client. Like sometimes we're sharing a, a client. Sometimes I'm just going in to like help out with that one thing. We're just partnering for that one uh, little particular piece of project. Thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So for an established agent such as yourself with a full stable, much harder to break in than with someone newer or joining a new agency or that sort of thing. Yes. Right. You should be querying if you, if you, you should be querying new agents. You should be querying new agents unless your friend is represented by me. So, and then you can get <laughs> right. the referral. And, right. um, you know, I, I mean, I want to, it's important to me that I be open to, um, um, representing people of diverse backgrounds who have like, you know, traditionally had, there've been not a lot of books published by um, people of their background, Pakistani writers, indigenous writers, um, where there's um, not enough books by those people. I mean, it's, it's important to me that I be available to be queried by those people. So, so I, um, I've just, I decided a few months ago that I was going to make sure that I stayed open um, without putting up that barrier that they needed a referral. Because for a long time, I only would look at things uh, by referral. And then I realized there's people who can't find me because of the referral. They can't reach me at all, you know? Right. So um, the, uh, the refer referral requirement, but still referral is, 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 you know, you often get good published writers on referral. Right, right. Totally makes sense. Um... How important, so we, you touched on uh, Twitter. That's a reality of today's world, the whole social media thing. Um, how important is it for a writer to come to you with an established social media presence? It depends on, the, on, where, on what they're writing because um, uh, adult nonfiction, for example, uh, what publishers will look for, HarperCollins will be, is this platform high enough? Is this a big enough platform? Does this writer have a big enough platform? And that's that can make or break your your book, your deal, and your and whether you're going to get a book published or not. If you are um, if you are working in certain areas um, that require where you know a big platform for someone, um, say a well known scientist, Chris Hatfield has a big platform. Um, Jamie Oliver has a big platform. Somebody with a TV show has a big platform. So. For, for, for nonfiction, um, adult nonfiction platform is everything and, um, or, or half of everything. The other thing is a good book, but platform is really, really important. Um, cookbook authors, 
platform is a really is really important for cookbook authors. Um, social media um, presence is something I, I look at. Like if I'm interested in somebody, I will go. If I'm like, oh, this is so interesting, I will immediately go out and go and check their social media. I will check to see if they have a website. Um, check to see what else they're doing. Okay. So it's something that uh, people do need to be doing. I was talking to a client today who's published by a smaller house, a uh, smaller Canadian publisher. Her book's coming out this weekend and her publisher is like, well, you know, basically it's up to you to do, to work on promotion, right? Like they send the book out for reviews, but they don't have, they're not HarperCollins. They don't have massive marketing budgets. They have very modest marketing budgets and they have one publicist representing the whole list for the, for the season. And um, so you need to be promoting yourself on social media and making connections and connecting with readers, connecting with um, librarians, um, connecting with people who'll be interested in your book. And, um, you know, you need a website with, with interesting other things or, I don't know, <laughs> it <can't>, Instagram followers. <laughs> well, right. It cannot be ignored is what I'm hearing you say. Is that no, you, you it just, can't. Okay. It can't. It uh, can't. Yeah. All right. And I think that's only going to get more so moving forward as, as more and more marketing efforts shift to online, whether you're with a big publisher, small publisher in between. Yes. You pretty much have to be, have a social media presence of some sort. Yes. And young, young, young people have all of this already. Right. So like young illustrators will already be on Instagram and be connected to all the other cool new illustrators on Instagram. They're following each other. Um, so if you are um, an older writer looking to get into the market, so if you're if you're middle aged and you're not really social media savvy, you should get social media savvy because your competition sure is. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Good uh, heads up for those of us who are no longer in our teens. <laughs> And I struggle with that too, right? Like I'm not totally comfortable with Twitter. You know, I mostly am reposting things from my clients and reposting things that my, my, um, uh, that the agency is posting first, you know? Okay. So uh, it's, it's, it is a, it is a thing that you need to, you know, but even agents, like, you know, we didn't have uh, 10 years ago, we didn't have the active Twitter feed that we do now right. as, as an agency. Right. We okay. had a Twitter feed, I'm pretty sure, but it wasn't very active. Right. So that's really become your place of hanging out. So do you hang out there as an individual, as an agent or uh, just um, through the agency? I, I have a Twitter. Yeah, I have a Twitter handle myself and I repost things, but I, I try to, I, it's not really, it, it's kind of a rabbit hole that I don't want to go down too far down. You know? <laughs> the other thing, I mean, there are, there are downsides to social media. If you focus too much on social media, you're not going to get any work done. And, and I've had, I've, I have talked to writers who are spending so much time trying to build their social media platform that they're like, well, I don't have any time to write anymore. No, the balance is off. <laughs> right. Okay. Go in very selectively. Right, right. Well, on that note, what is your Twitter handle? And then uh, just put you on the spot here. Do you know I don't that? remember. Oh, okay. All right. We'll post it afterwards yes. in, a, in a comment. That's no problem. Um, yes. How about, so you mentioned obviously having a social media presence and being active and participating in your marketing uh, that's a plus on the on the writer side yes um, but how would you describe your dream client what do you love to see in a writer um hmm. I love to see something that I haven't seen before I like to see um kind of a, a, a I like to see well I, as I said before like really good writing like I, I really love good writing whether it's in a chapter book or a board book a really strong for 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 people working in fiction a really strong sense of story even for people working in nonfiction, a sense, strong sense of story is really really important um i like to see professionalism that's very important to me if someone is is presenting with professionalism in even in their query you know if someone isn't being professional in their query then that's a flag for me that's not doesn't say oh i really want to work with them you know if, mm. if they're not presenting um, professionally so professionalism in terms of like developing their writing is um is also important you know that they have a that they're 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 working on their craft um and developing at, in appropriate ways at whatever stage of their career they're in um people who are who are publishing lots of books do that with their 
their publishers, you know, or they they have a, a critique partner or a writing group or something that they that they have um, they have a nice relationship with, you know, or maybe their people's spouses read their books and give them critiques. Like that happens too, right? They get lots of um, nice develop, you know, manuscript development that happens that way. Um, yeah, I like to see something fresh and new in okay. in 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 all things, I guess. <laughs> So fresh, new, professional, uh, somebody who's who's growing, learning uh, on an ongoing basis, that, that, that constantly yes. developing the craft. Yes. A passion for the craft. A passion for the craft and thoughtfulness about what they're what they're doing, too, because thoughtfulness right. is really important. I was watching um, a panel this morning uh, for the Toronto International Festival of Authors. Uh, there were th it was three. I, I was watching because one of my um, clients is an illustrator who's who's uh, a book she's illustrated is on the, um, the shortlist for the um, Marilyn Bailey mm -hmm. Picture Book Award. And so there were three illustrators and I was just so impressed. The thoughtfulness, you know, like my client, but the other two illustrators as well, the thoughtfulness that they put into, you know, the expression on the face of the characters. It was, it was, it was amazing. And they had obviously like thought deeply about their art, artistic practice and their, um, uh, yeah, it was really, really, um, yeah, thoughtfulness is important. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's turn this around now. And uh, for an author who is seeking an agent, are there any red flags that authors should be aware of? Agents oh, yeah. to stay yes. away from and how do you how do you know? Yeah, um, well, you need to do research. So if someone is um, part of a, um, um, an agent, a well-established agency with a good reputation, so um, there's lots of agencies that have like Transatlantic's been in, in business for more than 25 years. Westwood Creative Artists in Canada has been in business for more than 25 years. Peters Frazier's and Dunlop in the UK, I don't know how long they've been in business, many, many years. So if there's, there are like really well-established agencies. So um, usually if you're querying an agent with a well-established agency, you don't have to be worried that they don't know what they're doing because there, there are agents like, and I would say more in the United States than in Canada, because Canada is a small market. It's a very noble world. Um, anyone can put out their shingle and call themselves an agent, but you have to. And so if you're, if you're, if your agent is a sole practitioner or a very new agent, you need to, the person who, that you're talking to, you need to suss out how they're being trained, right? So all the new agents at Transatlantic have, are being trained in-house. They're being guided by the senior agents like myself um, through every step, through everything that they're doing. And they've got all kinds of, there's, there are people who know how to negotiate contracts. There are people who know how to answer this question and that question and help them evaluate things, help them put together submission lists. Um, if you're a sole practitioner, someone who has has who has come from editorial, they were a really successful editor maybe, and now they've decided that they're going to be an agent. Who is teaching them how to be an agent? Because that those are two diff very different things. Mm -hmm. There are certain parts of the publishing world that 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 are very close to agenting in some ways. So like people who were um, uh, rights managers. So people people who are rights managers know how to. Sell rights, like they and they understand contracts. Um, that's an area. Like one of my colleagues was um, the um, she was a vice president of the old McClellan and Stewart. She was in charge of rights and contracts. She started her own agency. No problem there. She eventually came to work with us because it's kind of lonely <laughs> running your own agency without like fun colleagues yep. to, to balance things off of. But she knew what she was doing. Um, so, so that's something, I mean, the other thing is you need to feel that whoever you're talking to, if someone's offering you representation, you need to feel comfortable with them and comfortable with their approach because there are a million different um, approaches uh, to, um, to the business. And um, there are like, you know, some of the stereotypes that you see on television about film agents where they're really, you know, like play it fast and loose with the, um, <laughs> The rules and the ethics. There are book agents who are actually like that. There really are. There, it's definitely more of a of a of a film industry thing because the film in industry is a lot more cutthroat than the book industry. Um, I never really worried that a book publisher is lying to me, but I if I'm if I'm dealing with um, 
a big production company, there's possibility, <laughs> there's possibility that that error in the contract was deliberate. The error mm -hmm. in their favor, maybe that was deliberate. You know, that's definitely possible. Um, so you need to be comfortable with the, the, the approach and the reputation of the person that, who's going to be representing you and make sure that you like them, that you feel that they get your work because not everybody gets everybody's stuff. You know, right. you don't, not everybody gets it. Um, um, yeah, red flags. Someone who charges reading fees. I'm just going to plug in my laptop. It's getting a little uh, draggy. Uh, charging reading fees is a big, um, can you, am I, am I getting, am I frozen? Lag, no, you're okay. You're lagging a little bit, but it's okay. We can still hear okay. you. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone who's charging reading fees, that's not, that's not an ethical agent. That's a big red flag. Um, you can also look on, uh, there are author websites called like editors and predators or predators and editors. You can look on that. Um, you, um, you can look for an, for agents who are affiliated with agents associations. So in the U in the U S there's an agents association in Canada, there's an agents association also in Australia and in the UK, they have agents associations and they're starting up all over the world. There's one in France, there's one in Spain. So agents affiliation with agents associations, um, uh, that's a good sign if your agent is affiliated with um, an agent's association um, because the um, agent's associations um, often they have like membership requirements, numbers of sales, things like that, um, ways that they're handling, like, like Transatlantic has um, uh, trust accounts. So we, any incoming money for our clients goes into trust accounts. It doesn't go into the same, the same bank account that we use to pay the phone bill. It's, it's different. So it's protected. And if the agency were ever to go bankrupt, the, the, um, the money is protected in trust accounts. So how your, um, how the money is being held, that is, um, uh, that's uh, something to look at. And if you're looking at, there are, uh, most of the time, most agents have contracts between them and their clients um, outlining the working relationship. Um, you need to look at how, um, what, what would happen if you decide that you don't want to work with that agent anymore or that they don't want to work with you. There's, there, there, there needs, there's something in that contract that, will, that you need to look at carefully and make sure that, that it's not too hard to get out of that relationship. Because there are agencies that that have um, sort of very punitive um, clauses, mm -hmm. very punitive wording. Even rep there are some, you know, even reputable agencies that have very punitive wording in their um, uh, in their client agreements. So you need to look at that. And there's there's information online about what to look for in client agreements. Okay. So I guess that leads into uh, another question. So you've gone through all of this work, you're preparing your query, you've met the agent or established a relationship, decided to work together, the, con the, the client agreement vets and, and there are no red flags. Mm -hmm. And the agent in, in uh, good conscience takes on the book and all good intentions and for whatever reason cannot sell it. Mm -hmm. What happens then? What, what happens to your project if if it just is not going to go anywhere. Yeah, usually it gets shelved. Like, you know, it's usually, you know, you have a, you have a conversation with your agent and you just, you know, I'll have a conversation with my client. I mean, only about half of picture books ever see the light of day, <laughs> picture book texts, because there's so many of them, you know, and it's, it's hard to write one that really is going to stand out in the marketplace. So um, uh, yeah, they, they often get shelved. Um, if your agreement is for only one book, so some agency agreements are for just one book, then you have are having like a serious conversation with your agent um, about what happens next. I've never worked for an agency that has those kinds of agreements, but um, I would imagine, you know, you decide at that point if you want to continue the relationship or just can't cancel the whole thing. Um, Sometimes people go on to self-publish things. Like if I can't sell something, I'll say, you know, and, and they'll say, well, can I self-publish? Sure. You right. know, 
Like so, and just to follow up on this point, so you mentioned most agencies do not have a one-off book. You know, you're coming in for the book. So, what is the arrangement? That it's a, a lifelong love affair until something goes sideways. Is that uh, more yeah. the structure of the standard? That's of- more. That's the standard structure. Um, I, I know that there are some agencies that don't even have a client agreement. They just put a, they, there's there's a thing called an agency clause in an agreement in a in a in, in a book contract if, if an agent is hand, if an agent is involved in the contract is, is negotiating the contract some agencies just use the agency clause so it's kind of a they have a handshake agreement with their client and then um the agency clause is the thing that sort of sets out the business arrangement um and 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 sets out what the commission um, rate is going to be um so it's there's there's a lot of there's a lot of variation the standard in my experience is is real client agreements that that are ongoing relationships it's like an ongoing business relationship but it's, i mean they're also like honestly they're personal relationships like you know they're they're very they're they're i you know i have i have personal relationships with all my clients like that's just the way it is and when we're set you know we're working closely together when there are when things are selling and things are being prepared for to go out um so uh there are it's a professional relationship but it's also like like a um you know you 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 it, it's more intimate than just like your accountant because because you know something happens in someone's life you you know about it because it's going to it's going to affect their their artistic their artistic output and and um that's just that's the way it is like it's 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 not quite as intimate as a hairdresser (laughs) 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 you know where you where they know a lot about you but um yeah um uh yes there's it's always possible though to break up with your agent um and or for your agent to break up with you and that you go your separate ways If, if the relationship isn't working anymore for you or for them for whatever reason Right. Um, and that should be laid out in the client agreement. Right. That is fair enough. Okay. Well, I think we've covered a huge amount of uh, territory here from the uh-huh. uh, beginning to end of the process. Uh, but is there anything else that you want to add that we didn't cover? Hmm. Anything we didn't cover? Um, not particularly. Um, hmm. All right. If someone, if, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? We're going to open it up for, uh, in case there are any quick questions here before yes. we wrap up, but yes. uh, what is the best way to, for someone to um, learn more about you, see who you represent, maybe get a feel for what it is you might be looking for? Where should they go for that information? Yes. Uh, Transatlantic Agency website, just Google Transatlantic Literary Agency. And um, I'm on the list of agents there and you can see uh, my client list and you can look through there. There are like news items on the, on the front page of the, um, uh, there are lots and lots of news items on the agency website. So you can see um, who I'm representing, who other people are representing. Um, and then uh, if you're wanting to approach someone just look at their look at their um, submission requirements, submission guidelines, and we've got lots of new agents who are looking for clients. So, you know. The good uh, heads up, a word to yes, us. Yeah, we do. Awesome. We have lots of really talented new agents. Right. Awesome. Very cool. Um, all right. Do we have any questions here um, from the live viewers? nothing popping up in the chat okay so that's fine people can reach out after the fact either to me or um through through uh, the agency website um i would just like to say a huge thank you amy for taking the time to join us today and share a little bit about this process of what an agent actually can and can't do in the process of working with an author Uh, This interview with Amy Tompkins is part of a series hosted by Writers on Fire, uh, which is a writing group online, which is hosted by the Nexus Generation community. So for more information about Writers on Fire, visit thenexusgeneration.net. So thank you so much. And for all of you watching now or in the replay, follow those words and see where they might take you. All right. Take care. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks, Nikki. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.